Thank you for joining us on the day. I'm excited that you're here. God has blessed us once again to be in this place and space to share the word of God and to declare the truth, even in the midst of this trauma and these tribulations that you and I are experiencing at this moment. So I want to invite you to go with me to a time of prayer as we enter in supplication and intercession before God. Let us pray. God, our Father, we're just so thankful for this day. We're thankful for this moment to share, to dialogue, to discuss your word. And we pray, oh God, that it will apply to those who are viewing online and listening by some other form of technology. Give us conciseness. Help us to be precise and profound as it relates to the text. And give us strength and encouragement to share thy word. It's in your daughter, son, Jesus the Christ, and we do pray. Amen. Once again, I'm excited that you're here, thankful and grateful that you're a part of this experience. So if you have your Bibles, turn with us to the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter number one, Nehemiah chapter number one. And we will look at verses three and four for the sake of brevity as we navigate through this particular narrative on this morning. Nehemiah chapter one, verse three and four. Listen as I read. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Nehemiah chapter one, verses three and four. I'm gonna tag this text during the sermonic spotlight with this thought, and that is this. Wise decisions start with prayer. Wise decisions start with prayer. A farmer hired a man to work for him. He told him his first task would be to paint the barn and said it should take him about three days to complete. But the hired man was finished in one day. The farmer set him to cutting wood, telling him it would require about four days. The hired man finished in a day and a half. To the farmer's amazement, the next task was to sort out a large pile of potatoes. He was to arrange them in three piles. The seed potatoes, food for the hogs, and potatoes that were good enough to sell. The farmer said it was a small job and it shouldn't take long at all. And at the end of the day, the farmer came back and found the hired man employee had barely started. What's the matter here? The farmer asked. He said, I can work, but I can't make decisions. <laughs> this is the identical spot that many individuals find themselves plagued by indecision or paralyzed by the inability to make the right decision simply because they are unaware where to start. Who do I marry? Should I take this job? What decision should I make about my health? Is this appropriate time for retirement? What about my children? What about my parents that I'm caring and trying to support? Indecisions or wrong decisions because of a failure of not knowing where to start. But ladies and gentlemen, I wanna encourage you because as we go down through the pages of antiquity, we're gonna discover a man who's a layman, who's a cup bearer, who's a wine tester or a food tester, if you will has a responsibility to be the right-hand man for the king. But yet, this man knows exactly where to start. It is this cupbearer, this wine tester, this food tester. Understand this. Here we are in the period of time in which the, uh, the, the children of Israel have been in captivity in Babylon for almost 70 years. And there's only a small remnant left in Jerusalem, but Nehemiah makes a decision to stay in Persia. And in the midst of staying in Persia, he has a prominent job. He has a good job. He has a well-paying job. He has a comfortable job. But lo and behold, he gets some tough and challenging and overwhelming news. 
That's where I want to invite you to walk with me in the midst of the text. So I want to invite you in to hear and discover what it's like to make wise decisions when you start with prayer. Look at, look at verses two and three. You will notice the text says in verse number two that Hannah, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left uh, of the captivity concerning Jerusalem. So uh, Nehemiah is talking to his brother and a certain set of men. So it's important for us to understand this, brothers and sisters, that in order for us to know how to make wise decisions and know that wise decisions start with prayer, the first thing we must understand is that oftentimes we are faced with complicated conditions. That's, that's point number one. We're faced with complicated conditions. In this moment, in this hour, in this time period, how do I make wise decisions? Now, I want to suggest that those wise decisions start with prayer, even though you are faced with complicated conditions. What are those conditions that Nehemiah is faced with? He's faced with the fact that there's bad news that has entered the scene, that has attempted to shatter him and strip him of his sanity. And see, that's what the enemy wants to do. He, he knows that if he can uh, uh, escort the bad news, he can create doubt and fear and anxiety and worry in your mind. And it's designed so that that news can shatter you and strip you of your sanity. But here is Nehemiah. He understands that he's in a posture, he's in a place, and he's in a pathway of prayer. So oftentimes we're faced with complicated conditions, big decisions, tough decisions, challenging moments. And what should we do when we're faced with complicated conditions? First of all, don't allow the bad news to shatter and strip you of your sanity because that's all that Satan wants to do. He came to do a couple of things. He came to steal, kill, and destroy and to create confusion, create doubt, to create anxiety. But wise decision starts with prayer. But we understand that in the midst of that, that sometimes we're going to be faced with some complicated conditions. Perhaps your complicated condition may be a, a health issue or a, a financial issue or a relationship problem. But I want to suggest that in the midst of this and what's implied in the text is that, that Nehemiah decided to not allow bad news to strip him and shatter him of his sanity. Because if Satan can create doubt, he can create fear, he can create anxiety in your mind, then he's gotten a foothold into your life. But understand this, we're gonna all face some complicated conditions, but don't allow the complicated conditions to consume you control you, nor devour you. But just understand that Satan is escorting the bad news. And when he's escorting the bad news, his desire is to strip you, shatter you of your sanity. So let's continue to march. So now here we are. His brother, his biological brother, brings the, the bad news along with a certain set of men. And that's what I want to say to many of you. This is a side note. Even if it's bad news, even if it's challenging news, whatever we do, whenever we bring the news, bring all the facts, bring the truth, bring the entirety so that the person can deal with it and address it right then and there. Nehemiah doesn't duck it. He doesn't dodge it. He does not dip away from it, but he's determined to stand before it. Wise decisions start with prayer. But we know that uh, we're going to be faced with some complicated conditions. But not notice this. But not only is he faced with the complicated conditions, but he formulates a character construction. Look, look what happens, if you will. After hearing the news, after hearing the, the troubles, after hearing the challenges, after being a recipient of the bad news, notice what happens in verse number four. This is where he formulates the character construction. So sometimes prayer is not always what God can get to us, but what God is doing in us. Watch what happens. It says, so it was. When I heard these words that I sat down, wept, 
mourned for many days. I was fasting and I was praying before the God of heaven. So here is where the character construction begins. The character construction merges because his brokenness escorts him through a process of transformation. What do you mean, Chambers? First of all, he was, he sat down, <laughs> he wept, he mourned, he fasted. Now, if that is not a character construction, I don't know what it is. This brokenness didn't leave him barren, didn't leave him bitter, but it moved him into a place of transformation. It was not about God getting something to him, but it was about God doing something through him. He sat down, so that means he slowed down. He wept because that's the language, the tears are the language of the soul. He mourned because he was broken. He was at an at a empty place where God could fill his cup once again. But now he's not filling the cup with Nehemiah, but he's filling the cup with more of God and less of Nehemiah. <laughs> The character construction merges because when his brokenness is escorted through a process of transformation, and you see the transformation, he goes from sitting to weeping to mourning. Now he's fasting. <laughs> fasting is not about taking something from you, but it's about getting something to you. It's, it's not about uh, derailing you, but it's about disciplining you. And so in the midst of that fasting, he's able to hear the voice of God, know the will of God, know the move of God, understand the hand of God. The character construction merges when his brokenness escorts him through a process of transformation. But the character construction merges when his brokenness escorts him to a place of mitigation. Notice here. Notice what the text says. He says, I was fasting. And then here it is. And praying before the God of heaven. The problem was too big for him. The issue, the matter was too overwhelming. It was too daunting. It, it, it exceeded his human comprehension. It exceeded his capacity. It, uh, and so he had to go to someone. So he was able to mitigate the risk of falling prey to doing it his own way or trying to fix the problem himself. He mitigates the risk by going to God. And not just any kind of God. It says, the text says, the God of heaven. So watch this, brothers and sisters. Understand this. Why is decisions start with prayer? Sometimes we're going to face the complicated conditions, but understand this. This next step is for you to formulate the character construction because prayer is not always about God getting something to you, but it's about what God is doing through you. But notice, if you will, the enemy uses the bad news to break you bewilder you, burden you for the purpose of clouding your judgment. Hold up and hinder your decisions making ability. So here it is, brother and sister. Here it is, brother and sister. Here, we, we got to understand that the enemy is on the job. He's on the case. If he can stop you from making the right decision, if he can cloud your judgment, if he can hinder you and hold you up from making the decision that God has ordained then he has accomplished his mission. So thirdly, not only do you need to formulate the character construction, but thirdly, you need to focus on the concise communication. Look what happens. And this is the very, the very crux and the very core of where we de definitely want to get in the text. So now, even though he may be Burden, even though he may be uh, broken, even though he may be bruised, even though he may be battered by the bad news, it does not prohibit him from bowing before an almighty God. Because the text says, now he focuses on the concise communication. So I want to encourage you. I want to invite you into the situation room. I want to invite you into the war room. I want to invite you into the inner closet, the secret closet, where he's having a conversation, not with his friends, not with his family, not with his cohorts, not with the king, but he goes in and spends some time talking to God, communicating with God, communing with God, articulating to God. But it's not just a one-way street. He's sending, but he's also receiving. Listen to what happened. Listen to verse number five. The text says, and he says, and I said, 
I pray, Lord God of heaven, O oh, great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant in mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servants, which I pray before you now, day and night for the children of Israel and your servants. Notice what happens. The first thing we have to understand here, brothers and sisters, as the first part of this is that as we listen to the text, let me just continue to read. He says he confessed the sins of the children of Israel, which have sinned against you, both my father's house and I have sinned. Verse number seven, we have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept our commandments. The statutes are not your ordinances, which you command your servant Moses. Remember, I pray the word that you commanded your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nation. Now, let me dial it back. So he focuses on concise communication. He engages in a time of prayer. He engages in a time of supplication, intercession. He talks to God. He speaks to God. He communicates to God. But it's not a one-way street. So why is this decision start with prayer? Now, we're in the situation room. We are in the, in the uh, headquarters of communication. And here we are. So here it is. Listen to what one thought leader said. Said it best. He said, your best decisions a birth in an atmosphere of prayer, living in an atmosphere of prayer so that our hearts are constantly pondering the choices that represent the will of God. Prayer is recognizing God as a partner in the, make, the decision making process. Prayer is the incubator of the best ideas and the source of our freshest creativity. Prayer is the lifeline for finding and fulfilling God's perfect will for what to do and what to say. Now, let's get down to the very framework of what his prayer looked like. Look at verses 5 and 6. You will notice that the first thing he does, he, he affirms the features of God. He says God is he's great and awesome. So literally, God is lifted. Isaiah said he's lifted high and lofty. He's eternal in the inhabitants. He is holy. He is lifted. He is so high that you can't climb over him. So he affirms the features of God by saying that God is lifted. But he also, he, he affirms the features of God by saying that God is looking. Look, look what the text says. The text says here clearly, he says, but let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open." What other kind of God will have his eyes open that's, that's engaging, that is uh, uh, seeing? Because no wonder the Bible says that God looks beyond the surface, the outward appearance, and looks at the heart. No wonder when Jesus, when, when he was dealing with people who was crippled and, and challenging and the woman in mourning, the Bible says he was able to look upon them with compassion. When the children of Israel or the people of God were, were looking for food, the Bible says that, that God fed them and he caused, he saw them and he had compassion on them. Not only is God lifted, but God is looking, but also God is listening. That's no wonder the, the old folks used to say that God is a prayer hearing and a prayer answering God. He affirms the features of God by saying that God is lifted. God is looking. God is listening. But notice here, if you will, if you look at verses 7 and following, the verse 7, he says, we have acted very corruptly against you and have kept not the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. First and second law, he not only affirms the features of God, but he acknowledges his own failures. And see, oftentimes when we go to God in prayer, it's give me this, give me that, but we never acknowledge our own failure. He acknowledged his failure spiritually because he said we have not kept the commandments. He acknowledged his failure morally because he says we have not kept your statutes or your ordinances. And then he, then he, he, he acknowledged his failure legally because he knows that he had went against the ordinances of God. So oftentimes when we come to God in prayer and we're looking for an answer, you, you, you got to affirm the features of God. You got to acknowledge your failure before God. But not only that, advance his faithfulness. Look at verse number eight and nine, if you will. It says, remember, I pray the word which you commanded your servant Moses saying, if you're unfaithful, 
I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and he keep my commandments, so do then, though some of you were cast out to the farthest part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling place for my name. You got to affirm the features of God. You got to acknowledge your own failures before God, but also you got to advance the faithful of that of God. Why do you think the scripture said, great is thy faithfulness and your mercies are new every morning. First of all, he's a God of discipline. He said that in verse number in verse eight and following, he talked about if they were not going to do right by God. That God was going to scatter them. Understand that and when we come to a place of prayer, understand that God is a God of discipline, but also God is a God of deliverance. In the midst of this prayer, it's amazing that oftentimes we skip over and want what God want God to bless us in spite of. But we don't want God to do anything in us while we're in the process of getting something from God. Here it is. He advances his faithfulness by talking about God is a God of discipline, but God is also a God of deliverance. But notice what Nehemiah does in verse number 10. He says, now these are your servants. Notice this. And your people whom you have redeemed by your great power, by your strong hand. Notice, if you will, Nehemiah says, we are children of the king. We are redeemed by the blood of the lamb. God, you got papers on us. You have ownership right. You have the title deed to our spirit, our soul, and our mind. Therefore, you have a responsibility. Therefore, you have an obligation to understand that no weapon formed against me shall be able to prosper. And that weeping may endure for the night, but joy still cometh in the morning. And that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. And that God shall supply all of your needs according to the riches and glory. So now Nehemiah says, now God, I understand your features. I acknowledge my failure. I understand your faithfulness, but I also need to announce your familiarity with your people, that we are children of God and we are recipients. We have rights. We have an inheritance. We have a blessing. So Nehemiah understands that wise decisions start with prayer, but oftentimes that prayer that we've been praying is trying to get, get something in our hand, but not willing to allow anything to happen in our heart. He announces this familiarity. Wise decisions start with prayer. And in the midst and the core of this prayer of Nehemiah, this is not a one-time deal. This is not a one-shot deal. This is something that was customary for Nehemiah. 11 times in the book of Nehemiah, uh, it's indicated that Nehemiah prayed for seven different circumstances. In the first chapter, he is first faced the need. The second chapter, Nehemiah speaks to the king. The fourth chapter, he's reproached by his enemies, but he prayed. He was threatened in, in his life, but he prayed. Enemies threatened to attack him, but he prayed. Nehemiah was preparing to lead the people in worship, but he prayed. And then finally, in chapter 13, he says, Lord, remember me. But wise decisions start with prayer. Understand this, ladies and gentlemen. It's imperative for us to understand this, that sometimes we're going to face the complicated conditions. But secondly, we have to formulate the character construction. Thirdly, focus on the concise communication. But fourthly and finally, Facilitate the compelling course. Nehemiah goes through verse number 10, and then he comes to verse number 11, facilitating the compelling course of compelling calls. Verse number 11, he says, Oh Lord, he's at the final part of his prayer. I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant. And to the prayer of your servants who are desired to fear your name, let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now notice what he says, for I was the king's cupbearer. And so now he says, 
He facilitates the compelling cause. He says, I have a vision. I have a dream. I have a desire burning in my heart. And he does not come to God as a double-minded man or an unstable man in all of his ways. But he comes believing in advance that God is going to do something. How do you know, James? Because the last part of that text, let me go ahead and back up with this. He says, for I was the king's cupbearer. Outside of the prayer, he is the king's cupbearer. He's still employed by the king. He's still working for the king. But when he goes to the king of kings, he's proclaiming and claiming the, the productivity of God, the process of God, and the prosperity of God, and the purpose of God. Because he says, for I was the king's cupbearer. Wise decisions start with prayer. And finally, it facilitates the compelling cause. He says, he says, your ears be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. Let your servant prosper this day. Grant him mercy in the sight of this man. He says, little God, I know that you can fix it. I know that you can change it. I know that you can do it for me. He says, I'm going to proclaim it even though it has not physically come to pass, but it has spiritually come to pass. It has come to pass eternally. And you have designed me for this moment, for this opportunity, and for this purpose. And so my, my decision has started with prayer. And it leaves me with prosperity and productivity and positions me right before the king. So the king has no choice but to make an affirmative decision for Nehemiah. Because he says, let your ear be attentive. God is still listening. He's still hearing our prayers. He facilitates the compelling cause. Ladies and gentlemen, it's important for you to understand this, that wise decisions start with prayer. We jump off in chapter number one. The majority of chapter one is consumed with the prayer. The book starts in prayer and the book almost literally ends in prayer. Wise decisions start with prayer. Wise decisions start with prayer. Therefore, prayer must be a habit and not a last resort. Wise decisions start with prayer. Therefore, prayer must be for me to hear God's heart and not just for God to hear mine. Wise decisions start with prayer. Therefore, prayer must be a passion and not just a passing thought. Whatever you do, ladies and gentlemen, men and women, whenever you're in a fix, whenever you're in a tight, Whenever you're in a tough situation, whenever your back is against the wall, I know it's easy to call everybody, but the first place you want to start is on first base. And God can guarantee that you will eventually hit a home run if you start in the right place. Why do you think Matthew says it this way? Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness and all of these other things will be added unto you. So I want to encourage you today, as we continue in these series of sermons, Wise Decision Starts With Prayer. Last week we talked about the, the pathway to wise decisions. And we will continue these series of uh, messages around wise decision making because I think it's crucial and it's important in the time in which we live. So if you're today, here today and you don't know Jesus in the pardon of your sin, you've never accepted him as your personal savior and Lord, this is an awesome opportunity for you to accept Christ and allow him to enter into your life. We want you to do that today. Or perhaps you're that person that has become disconnected, disillusioned with this thing we call spirituality or Christianity. I want to invite you back into the fold so that your life can be changed and your life can be different. So let us go to God in prayer. God, we just thank you for this day, Master. Most of all, I thank you for your darling son, Jesus Christ. God, I pray for this individual who's praying right now. Uh, he or she believes, confess, and admits that they're a sinner. 
And they want you to come into their life right now, God, and change them, consecrate them, and make them right before them. But most importantly, God, we're praying that you come into their heart now and save right now. Perhaps, God, that person is not in that category, but is in another category. Uh, except that you at some point in time in their life, but just became disillusioned or walked away because of their own uh, challenges or issues or some things that may, they may have been exposed to or experienced, um, even in the context of the church. We want to pray for that person. God, I'm going to pray right now. God, I pray now that you come in my heart and restore me, reset me, rekindle, rekindle the fire that I once have had me previously. So God, we're praying that you help me to start afresh, to reconnect with you, to reconnect with a, a body of believers. We're praying this prayer right now. God, we thank you for all that you do. It's in your daughter, son, Jesus Christ, and we do pray. Amen. Now, if you prayed either one of those prayers just before you, there is a digital form. I want to encourage you to fill out and complete at this moment in time so that you can give us that information. We want to walk with you and to be able to uh, to engage with you in the process and the pathway of Christianity. We want you to know that you're not in this thing by yourself. So we would love to, for you to be a part of this fellowship of believers. So fill out that form, complete it and send that in to us and we'll be ever so grateful. Now, before I leave from this, um, this moment of sharing on the day, I do want to encourage you. Uh, as I've said over the last several weeks, uh, those of us who are of African-American descent, um, our ancestors have paid a huge price, have lost so much, have been denigrated and uh, destroyed and devoured in so many different ways to give us a right to vote. We are in that season where we have an opportunity uh, to, to exercise our rights as citizens of this country. And I wanna encourage you to not only just do it because it's the right thing to do, but do it because remember those ancestors who gave so much and sacrificed so much for you and I to have an opportunity to vote. So I wanna encourage you to, to invite your friends, take your family members and strangers and encourage them to go out and vote. But most important, make sure that you're able to vote. Either vote by absentee ballot, uh, go in person, if that is, is that feasible for you, we would encourage you to do that as well. Uh, or the mail-in ballot, that's another option for you. So you have three different options. So we do want to encourage you to make sure that you take care of your responsibility. And in the words of John Lewis, we got to vote like we never voted before, uh, as though our lives depend upon it, because it literally does. So I want to encourage you to remember these words, to walk with the king and be blessed. I'll see you again next week. God bless you.